I know every one of you in this room has experienced drama. And it's possible that some of you are participating in a dramatic Broadway show right now. Hopefully it's not with the person sitting next to you. So drama is the stuff that happens outside of ourselves. It's when you have those temper tantrums, those insecurities, those needy vampires, you know the ones at work, your relationships, some of your friends, and we start to allow it to get out of control. And when we allow it to get out of control, we start to lose the grip on our purpose, which comes from the inside. You've all been there when we've overindulged in anything in our lives. You know how crappy you feel after, like you've eaten a huge meal, you had too much dessert, maybe too much to drink. You usually suffer through it, but after enough time passes, you start to feel better, you digest, and you start to be relieved. The same thing goes for the drama in our lives. But drama tends to affect us emotionally. And then it starts to affect other areas of your lives which can impact you psychologically and physically. And then drama starts to lead to stress. How many of you believe that stress can make you physically ill? Okay, so how many of you believe that stress, if you lessen the stress and lessen some of the drama in your lives, your body knows how to autocorrect and you start to get better? So if many of you believe this, why don't we do it? Why do we allow the drama and the stress to start to take over? Why do we allow it to get out of control? I'd like you to imagine that we're going to plant a rose. Okay? You take the seed, you plant it, you nurture it. You know that after enough time from it's going to become a beautiful rose bush. But the minute you neglect it, it starts to get stressed. What do you need to do to save it? You cut it back, you prune it, you give it some time and rest. As spring arrives, is that rose bush a goner? No, it can come back even bigger and better than it did before. Nature has done its autocorrect. So if we believe this is the case in nature, why don't we have faith that the same thing won't happen for ourselves? You are all seeds. Your souls intuitively know what you need to regenerate. But we don't do it. And I'm telling you this because I was there. I was in the ER, on my back, an absolute mess, disturbed vision, numbness in my hands, I'm freaking out, I'm scared, I'm an absolute disaster, and I'm thinking worst case scenario, I'm having a heart attack. Doctor comes in and he says, he starts reviewing my symptoms for the day. He says, what have you done? I said, oh, I run, I'm in good shape, I eat healthy. And then he says, is it possible you're pregnant? That's when I nearly passed out. <laughs> I said, it's impossible. And then he said, nothing's impossible, completely freaking me out all the way over to the edge. I was done. So he said, clearly something's wrong with you. We're going to figure it out, run some tests, and see what's going on. It's a hot day. You've been running, so I'm thinking you're dehydrated. So they proceeded to give me IV fluids, and we waited. Several hours later, I'm not better and no solution. So the doctor comes in, and he says, all right, I have all the results back. And he takes his time coming in and sitting down next to me, giving me way too much time to think about every bad diagnosis he could give me. He says, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, that was not the answer I expected. Then he said, is it possible you're under any stress? Who, me? Stress? I don't have stress. I fix stress. And then he said, I believe you're having an anxiety attack. It was then that I realized I was in trouble. So let me share with you how my disillusioned mind, full of drama, put me in the ER that day. I had been living on four hours of sleep for several years. I drank over a pot of coffee a day. I ate healthy, but not enough because I was too busy. I would just run a half marathon. I was training for a new race. I had two little girls. I was running around to extracurricular activities, running a business. I had just authored a book, trying to have a social life with loads of drama and in financial strain all to participate in a world that told me what happiness was. And I know many of you have been in this place before. You know that feeling of hanging off the cliff? How did I get here? How many of you in this room exercise? 
Okay, how many have exercised once? <laughs> uh, okay, but once works for this example. So what happens after you haven't exercised in a while? You go out and exercise, how do you feel the next day? It hurts, right? Sometimes you can't lift your arms, you can't sit down. But that after you repeat that activity over and over again, you start to have less pain and more strength. Now, in order to continue to get stronger, what do we need to do? You need to start increasing the resistance to your muscles so they can grow. Lifting air doesn't do a whole lot for the muscle. But lifting a weight, putting resistance and pressure against that muscle makes you stronger. So what happens when we try to exercise new thoughts in our mind? So we all get unbalanced, right? In our lives, somewhere, in our finances, our relationships, our image. Why do we feel it's okay to have a little pressure after exercising, knowing that it's going to make you stronger and healthier, yet we resist the other pressures in life? What kind of pressures are you avoiding in your life? Because pressure is what creates growth. And then there's healthy pressure, and then there's toxic drama. It fascinates me with all the self-empowerment information available to us these days. Why is it that some people excel and others don't? It's because we get sidetracked by the external drama. And then we get detoured from our life purpose and what we want. How many of you have a mission statement at your company? If you think about that mission statement, for most of you, you can think it's very long and difficult to remember. I found this interesting pattern when I was tra training companies across the country. Those with short mission statements, some with four words or less, had greater success because they all knew why they were there. And a short mission statement is important for everyone on a personal level as well. Why do you get out of bed every day? What do you want and why? I call this your wow. Now, yes, you don't need to correct me. I know this doesn't spell wow, but we're going to call it your wow. What? And I, I was corrected by it earlier. What do you want and why? It needs to be something bigger than you. And as simple as this sounds, what do you want seems to be a pretty difficult question for many. I don't know is the typical answer. And I think that's just a cop-out. Deep down at your core, we all know what we truly want in our lives. You might be afraid to say it or want it, but it's there. If you want a successful company or a family or a relationship, choosing one single word, inspiration, success, or love, might not be a bad idea. My personal wow, as she might have mentioned earlier, is three words, to raise self-worth. It is my mission every day, no matter who I touch. So I want you to decide on what your what and why are and make it for words or less. Now, let's say you chose mine to raise self-worth. The next time you go to work and your boss criticizes your project, starts throwing a temper tantrum and tells you his wife wants a divorce, remember your wow. You're there to raise self-worth. Now, once you're on this road to your mission and you've figured out what your wow is, self-empowerment and self-awareness is the key. How well do you know yourself? Do you have any idea of the impact you have when you walk into a room? Are you aware of your subconscious habits that are dictating your behavior? A lot of people tell me, oh, it's not easy to access my subconscious. I believe it is. I'd like you to imagine that you just mo you moved into a new office. It's in the office, it's empty, and so you open the box, and in it is the clock, right? So you take the clock out, you hang it on the wall, and it's a pretty empty room, so you start hearing tick, tick, tick. But then once you get settled in that office, I come in to visit, and I say, how do you work in here? And you're like, why? I love it. It's fantastic. I said, because that clock on the wall is so loud. And your reply is, I don't even hear it anymore. That same experience is taking place with the thoughts that are ticking in your heads over and over and over again. And some of us for 10, 20, 30 years. But sadly, you don't hear it. Ticking thoughts of, I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. 
I'm not successful, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm poor. Tick, tick, tick. The words are different for everyone, but the clocks are there. And for sadly, some, for, for some more than one. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So I encourage you to get quiet. Pay attention to the thoughts that are ticking in your head. And if they are in any way uninspiring, take the battery out of the clock. Hang a new clock in your mind with inspiring words. I'm amazing. I'm successful. I'm knowledgeable. I'm abundant. And do it daily so it becomes a habit. Which brings us to unconditional love. The most healing drug on this planet is love. But we have become obsessed with more and bigger and better, yet we are still lacking love and connection. We're so depleted of self-love, yet we proceed to share our limited resources while we're stressed and overwhelmed and exhausted with others, hoping that they're going to return it to you, only to find out that they're returning their toxic drama. And many people start to become drama gas stations. So here's the drama gas station for you. I'll bring you back to the wow in a minute. Let's see how we get it here. All right. This is you. Excuse my not perfect circle. You're feeling pretty good. You're 100% full. This is your gas tank. But then along comes this amazing person. They're not totally full. They're a little bit of drama in their life. So as some time passes, you think they think, oh, I could use a little support. So you think, I can help, and you give them a little gas, bringing them down and you up, not really noticing it until they think, this is fantastic, I want more. So you proceed to give them more of your gas, bringing them up to a full tank, and you into depletion. And when you're left depleted, now your tank isn't feel, filled, you expect your tank to be replaced and replenished. But you cannot give from what you didn't have in the beginning. You can't give from what you never had. And so you want them to reciprocate. And when they don't do this, the power struggle for gas unfolds. When you give expecting something in return, this is not a gift. This is a loan. And your intention is to continually start giving yourself with no strings attached, giving yourself 100% or over, becoming a surplus, right? And allowing others to become a surplus. Building a full gas tank with a surplus happens by loving your needs unconditionally, taking care of you so that when others are in need, you can give from your surplus, and it is a gift. But when others are depleted, please refrain from fixing them. It's their journey. Allow them to have it. Allow them to heal their drama. The way you support them is with encouragement and love. Raise their self-worth. Remember your wow. So let's revisit my day in the ER. If you remember, nothing was wrong with me. And the worst part of leaving the ER that day was I was still feeling like crap, and Miss Instant Gratification was not happy with the prescription because it was rest. And in that moment, I realized, like the rose bush, I needed to detox my life and realized all this pressure was pushing me to grow. And so I went on a TLC mission. I started sleeping and taking naps. Sleep's amazing when you actually start getting it. I started nourishing my body. I quit running anything over two miles and realized I despise running long distance. My half marathon was through Disney, and I will tell you, it was not the happiest place on earth. It was horrible, but I did it to fit in with my running friends. I got really good at saying one word to friends and social events. Guess what word? No. I started, I, well, I quit drinking coffee in excess amounts. I still do a little, but I lessened that amount. I started filling my soul by doing what I love. 
I began reading for hours instead of being invited to all these other social events. That's what I loved. I took my girls out of all extracurricular activities that, that stretch my time and my finances. And the first day after clearing our calendars, I picked them up after school. And I said, where do we have to go today, Mom? I said, nowhere. We're going home. And you know what their reply was? Ah, cool. Because they wanted it too. And all of this extra time that we started sharing together, we started connecting, laughing, and loving. Now, this wasn't an overnight fix, but I started seeing something really cool happening. I started becoming full and overflowing. And I became diligent and loving my needs unconditionally. And a most amazing thing happened at the end of this journey. I found my happy. So to detox your drama, please remember, shorten your mission statement so you know why you're getting out of bed every day. Pay attention to the thoughts that are ticking in your head. Make sure they're playing amazing thoughts. And close your gas stations to drama. Thank you.